let's jump right to the presentation. Our really good friends, Woody Zool yes. and Llewellyn Falco are back. Thank you, everybody. And they're going to talk about two minutes to better code. So take it away. We'll be done by 6.45. <laughs> yeah, we failed to tell you, it's two minutes to better code over and over and over. So this is two minutes times... It's a lot of two minutes. Better is not the same as good. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, before we even get started, I guess we should um, introduce ourselves. But uh, we've been here. Does anyone have anyone not seen us present already? So we have we have three. All right. So I guess well, a, yeah. a small introduction. Well, let's start with you, Woody. So I'm Woody Zool. I'm a software developer. Been coding for about thirty years. Uh, right now, I'm a, a manager of a team of developers, and I consider myself an agile coach. And my main focus is maintainable code. Yeah. So that's probably enough said about me. That's Llewellyn. I'm Llewellyn. I'm an instructor for development. I'm also the uh, creator of Approval Test and the co-founder of Teaching Kids Programming. And again, a lot of what I do is get into code and help get it maintainable, help get it so people can work with it again. And that's what this talk is going to be about today. Yep. So let's get started. Question we always ask. Show of hands, how many guys are working with Legacy Code? One, two, three, four, yeah. five, at least half. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so, um, so what is Legacy Code? Anyone have any uh, definition? Code that has legs. Code that has legs. <laughs> that would be Leggy Code. Leggy Code. Leggy Code. Leggy code. code. Code that no one wants to work with. It's probably because it's been touched by more than two or three developers in its lifetime. Code yeah. that's been touched by more than two or three developers. Ugly, ugly code. code. Yeah. So yeah. I, I have a For some reason, like legacy code is always seen as like the ugly bad code, and that's exactly how we mean it. But in theory, you could have legacy code out there that is beautiful that's and right. groomed. So what le I, I have a different definition for legacy code, and I, I feel that legacy code is any code that we have that is doing something we want it to keep doing after we've worked on it, like fixing bugs or adding a new feature. Whereas this code we want to have keep working. It's yeah. our legacy. It's what it, we, we've inherited or made ourselves, but we want to keep it working. To me, that's legacy code. And that means most projects, Yeah. Uh, a couple weeks after you've started on them, you, you've got some kind of code there you want to keep from breaking, yeah. right? It's, you've got something working. That's legacy code to me. It, code is either going to get rewritten at some point or die. Like Those are the two paths for code, right? And so I'm, I'm very interested in keeping code working and maintainable even when it's old. We have a car here. <laughs> for sale? Now, yeah, it is for sale. And if you bought it, it would probably drive off that, that lot. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> we're, we're hypothesizing here. Um, they got it there somehow. Very often. This is, I think, how a lot of people feel about their code pieces. And, and it brings across, I think, what is the common response. Because a lot of people take things that are not part of the programming life and apply it to the programming life. And, and the translation doesn't always work. But most people in this situation see that the answer is clear. It's time to buy a new car. All right? In software, this is called a rewrite. You get to go to Greenfield. It's very, very promising. Again, it doesn't translate nicely. But what we want to show you is a different path. This is the same car. Pretty it's much. still an old car. But think of the differences between this and the other. Can we put those sort of side by side? Think about the difference in the owner. Think about like which owner is like proud of their car. Which one is showing it off on the weekend? Right? Who's happy? Who, and which one is like, I need to get rid of this. This is stinking up my whole yard. And we we want to show you a path. This talk is about a path from one car to the other car. How to take that and make it a car that you can be proud of. And I've worked in old systems where people are happy and they are proud and they go home smiling. It's not just a fantasy. It's something that is achievable and we want to talk about how to get it. So that's what we're about here. We can show you really simple techniques that anyone can use. You don't have to be a genius. Uh, you can just be a beginner if you use these techniques. 
Yeah. These are simple things, and that's our goal during this talk. But you, that's a really important point that you just said. A lot of people, I think, they think excellent code is reserved for these super geniuses, you know, live in the towers of Redmond, and, and everyone else is doomed to bad code. But that's not been our experience at all. No, they, they're in Cupertino. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, because I did finally get myself here with this map app on here. But anyways. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but this, is the, this is the truth of yeah. it. Code yeah. excellence is more about discipline than it is about brilliance. And we're going to be showing really simple techniques. That's the whole point of this. It, it doesn't take brilliant techniques to do this. So let's go on a little bit. So let's talk about the project. So what we're going to be using, I'll show you some code here. Um, I'm going to run this little app. What we have is a simple application that makes charts. Now this is probably a little more complicated than most of you guys usually do. But there's a bar chart. Okay. This actually represents something complicated. Um, this code has been sanitized. So, yeah, so this came from an people. actual project that I worked on a long time ago that they brought to me and they needed to do some changes to. So we took the guts of that, stripped out a lot of it so it, it kind of would work well in a demonstration. So this represents a bar chart. They also decided somewhere along the way that they would like to have a pie chart. So that represents a pie chart. And this is how I've seen a lot of legacy go. It grows over time. More Projects complex. grow over time. They got something working. They really like it. Hey, we could do this other thing too. Now what happened shortly afterwards was they didn't want to just have those big charts. They wanted charts they could display one next to each other. So they came with this idea of a comparable chart. So they would be just a smaller version that they could show either a, a, a pie chart next to a pie chart or next to a bar chart or whatever at a smaller size. Now, at the smaller side, you need slightly different data, right? Slightly you just different data. Everything. You can't see anything. Yeah, it's just not a smaller chart. It has a more condensed uh, amount of information in it. Yeah. That's not uncommon either. So we end up with having different paths through the code. We'll look at the code real quickly just to see. And this we're going to be spending most of our time in this code base. So we want to give you an overview ahead of time. So there's not a lot of code in here. We have 274 mm -hmm. lines. But this project originally was something around 50,000 lines. Do the code. map mode and show them sort of. Oh, you got to remember. Mem uh, in the scroll bar. In here. Yeah. Right click. And show full mode. Show full mode. So, so this is a, just a condensed view. It comes with power tools that lets you see sort of the shape of the code that we're going to be working in today. All righty. So we know a little bit about the project. You don't need to know much more about that. But I will say the reason I was called in. I guess I've got to right click somewhere yeah. here. Huh? And uh, scroll bar. Scroll yep. That's bar mode. Okay. Um, they called me in to say they, they were needing to add something new. We'll talk a about line that. chart, yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that. They needed to add a new kind of chart. And they kept breaking the existing code. So that's their legacy code. Even though this guy had been working on it all this time, he'd been like now a month trying to put this new kind of chart in there. They couldn't get it back into production. So that's where, that's where we're starting from. That is, because every time they, they did it, they broke it. They broke something. And, and you can kind of see why, but we'll go into more details yep. later. We won't make you commit this out loud, but I think it's worth taking a second to think, if this was your job, right, you got thrown into what we just shown you, about how long it would take you to start understanding what we just put in front of you, figuring out how to do line chart. Just give it a second. If you had to give an estimate, we're not a believer in estimates, but I think it's worth taking the time to just think about it. Estimate what specifically? How much time it would take you if you were given the job, please add a line chart to this code base? Four hours. Four hours. To, to get a handle on how it's working. Yes, All right. So we'll come back to that question later, but I just wanted to give you guys sort of initial thoughts. All right. Let's jump back to Aren't our... Aren't you also supposed to multiply by three? Did you do that? No. Okay. <laughs> so 12 hours? Yeah. And then double that? Okay. So, let's go back to our slides, eh? Yeah. <coughs> this Pardon. is the principle that we are going to go in today. And if you leave knowing nothing else, like this is the most important thing. This is from the Boy Scouts, right? Yeah. So, the idea is we're going to whenever we work on a code, we're always going to leave it in a little bit better shape than it was when we got there. Cuz the only, only alternative is to either leave it as bad as it was or let it get worse. And you know how we saw like this code base grow from the simple chart to the pie chart? 
complexity grows over time too. And a lot of people, they, they're under pressure. So they're thinking about like what's due next week or at the end of the month. But the truth is most people stay at their jobs for months and years and even multiple years. Scamanzi was there for 28 years, right? You have a long time and where your code base is going to change. And if it changes a little bit worse each day, in a year, a year and a half, you're going to have bad code. And if it changes a little bit better each day, in a year and a half, you're going to have good code. Yeah. And these are how those things work. It's not about like massive changes. It's small changes over time. That's so why this is, this is two minutes. When we talk about two minutes. And that's why we talk about better, not yeah. good. That's right. So let's go on. We want it to be a little more concrete about that thing. Let's talk to a lot of people and they say, how do I get time to refactor? This is what we're going to be talking about. Never be more than two minutes away from checking in and going home. Especially the going home part. <laughs> so if you can get in at 8, 8 o'clock and be go, going home at 8.02, 8 .02, excellent. Good work. Another point, if you get in at 8 o'clock and you work for 10 minutes, and your boss comes and interrupts you, new problem for today. You don't want those 10 minutes to be wasted. You don't want those 10 minutes to be something you're going to revert on your checkout. You want to be able to check that in, cash in into that 10 minutes of work, and go on to the next problem. All right. And, and we want to be very concrete about this two minutes. So we have a timer here. It's going to be a little hard to see for some of the people in the room. But every time we can check in, and we might not actually check in, by check in, and sometimes we will check in, but by check-in, we mean our tests are passing, we could check in. Not necessarily that we're going to check in. So every time our tests pass, we're going to reset the clock. And if it ever gets to two minutes and we have not had passing tests, we want you guys to yell at us. Keep us honest. Keep us working in two-minute chunks. We'll start that when we actually start the code. You want to tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, so you got to get yourself prepared for being able to do this. There's a few things we're going to recommend and show you. And the basic idea is, first of all, you got to have tests. If you don't have tests in place, it's going to be very difficult to do the kind of work quickly that we want to be doing. Tests are like your armor. Tests mean that when you mess up and that sword comes by and hits you, if you're wearing armor, it's not going to kill you. If you have tests, it's not going to kill you. Same idea. Tests are going to protect you when you get hit. And now you're going to get hit, so they're good things to have. And this talk isn't about having tests, so that we just want to make it clear you got to find a way to get tests. But we do have tests, and we are going to use We them. do have tests. Do we want to look at that right now? Not yet. But okay. I do want to point out that I've seen people who have tests who don't run them while they're refactoring. That is, in my idea, the worst of the sins you can create. If you have tests, use them. Yeah. Don't let them get old. All right, you got to have tools. So in this case, our tools are our environment. Things like we're using ReSharper. Um, what else? We're going to use some InCrunch. We're going to use some MS Test. There's a whole bunch of tooling that we're going to use, and we'll pay attention to it. Again, the best warriors have good armor, and they have good tools. Like a sword. Like a sword. Okay. Good. Sword takes a punch and makes it much I more deadly. I see where this. I see how this works. All righty. The last that. thing is they also have some skill. Why didn't we call that skills? <laughs> so skills are usually patterns. It's, it's what you have already been trained to recognize. When this happens, I know how to deal with it. I've been trained for it. I can recognize that maybe I need to bring out this pattern here. Maybe I need continuing pattern here. Maybe I need chain of responsibility pattern here. I'm not discovering a new thing. I've been trained for this situation. So a lot of the techniques we use are similar types of patterns we can use. And you can read about them in a lot of books. And you're going to see about some of them here. All righty. Oh, let's capture this. Yeah. We have a place to capture. Uh, yeah, kind of. I'll capture it as much as I can here. So just, uh, we'd like to hear from you guys. What does it make, what are the things that make code hard to work with? Give me an example. The lack of documentation. Is hard no documentation. Yeah. What else? No clear standards. Coding standards? Poor coding standards. Poor coding standards. Yeah. Or non-existent. Or multiple standards in one multiple, code body. Multiple code standards in one code body. So coding stand, no coding standards or multiple. Not a single. Right. 
What else? We're not third-party libraries that aren't <laughs> yeah. very well documented. Third-party <laughs> libraries are not well documented. I'm just going to say other people's code. Okay, other people's code. Hard-coding values. Hard-coded values. You mean like constants or I mean literals? Uh, literals in the code, magic numbers. Yeah. Yeah. All, all the anti-patterns, God classes, stovepipe, all the others. Okay, let's try some of those. So what is stovepipe? Where UI is talking directly to the database. In, in a uh, nutshell, that's one way to stovepipe. Yeah, let's do highly coupled. <laughs> Tightly coupled. <laughs> other things? So you said God class. So that's like large classes? Yeah. It does everything. Does everything? Global variables. Now we're talking. What else? You guys have been living in this stuff. You know what? What is it? What's your pet peeves in your code? Anything else? What about bad names? What's that? Um, it can be. What if you have bad naming conventions? I talked to a guy once who said, you have to use one-letter names until we've run out of all the letters. <laughs> Believe it or not. I've seen people present with one-letter names. <laughs> okay. That's not a, what about breaking the bill? Um, <laughs> code that doesn't compile. Code that doesn't compile. <laughs> Broken codes. What else? Well, I, poor, poor indentation. And, uh, and bad formatting. Bad formatting. formatting. Bad formatting. Reusing variables or, or reusing oh, variables. well, I like that one. Oh, that is very good. Yes, uh, that's a nice one. I don't know if we double can. Double duty. Improper scoping. Improper, improper scoping. There's lots of rules about these things, but we see this in our code all the time. And, what, and basically, this is all we're going to talk about. So you guys already know what we're going to say, but we're going to say it anyways. Because we signed up for the whole two hours. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are the things we're talking about. So what did I do uh, there? Just click the... Click. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about how to do it. We're also going to give you sort of uh, a large pattern to follow, to go into code. Now, yeah. part of what I do as a consultant is go into rescue projects. So this is the pattern I use. I've gotten a lot of value out of it. Not the only pattern. You'll see us move between steps, um, but it's a very useful pattern. So we want to start there. So the first thing is remove the three C's. Clutter, complexity, and cleverness. And we're going to remove them in this order. So let's start with clut clutter. Okay. So removing clutter. Clutter, we have a definition for this. We want to make this really clear. Clutter is anything in your code that does not add value. The reason it's clutter is because it makes it hard to work on the stuff that does have value. Harder to read the code, harder to see the patterns, so on and so on. So we, we don't want anything in there that makes it difficult for us to understand the code. I don't know if we talk too much to that, but there is this idea that we only have really two users of our code, humans and computers. So a computer can Compile anything that's compilable, anything it can read, it can work with it. Doesn't matter if it's pretty much a big mess. As Martin Fowler said, "Any fool can write code that a compiler can understand. It takes real work to write code that a human can understand." Exactly. That's well put, Martin. I agree wholeheartedly with that. So that's sort of what we're talking about. We've got to make it easy for and us to read. And we should say, like, there are different ideas of what provides value and what does not. For this talk, it's going to be if we think it provides value, but. <laughs> But that doesn't mean that that's the only way. When you're working with your code, it means what you believe provides value. Yeah. Right? But we'll probably agree on most of it here. I think we're going to find so. that. So let's see. We okay. talked about this already. We're going to do some comments. We're going to do some dead code. We're going to do some unnecessary code. Oh, no. Let's go to the code. Okay. Okay, so first of all, two-minute rule is in effect. So do me a favor. Run the test. Let's see that they all pass. Oh, yeah. Let's do that first. So you can see here, all the code is passing. I'm going to start the clock. Okay. Everybody start. can see this okay? Yeah. All right. Well, let's start at the top. Oh, we should tell the scenario, too. Uh, in this scenario, 
you're going to be working with the code. Well, yeah, so I'm going to kind of take the role of, of the guy who had called me originally who said, I, I've got this code we need to get into production, but we keep breaking the dang thing. And that means you know something about the so code. So I've been working in this, well, for the last month, plus I wrote most of it myself in the first place. Yeah. So he doesn't know everything about the code, but at least I can ask some questions to him. I'm going to come in as the person who knows nothing about the code. We're going to go in that. But he knows how to clean code. That's sort of the, that's sort of what we're up to. Okay, so, so let's first do it. of all, we should notice um, up here on lines two through four, you'll notice they're in gray, right? And that's because they're not being used. This is our tooling, right? This is ReSharper telling us that's not being used. Let's get rid of it. We can quick fix or we can delete. Sorry, remove unused directives in file. So let's do that. Oh, actually, and even more than that, let's scroll up and down on this file for a second. Oh, sure. Notice that it um. It's, yeah, it's not in dinner, right? So let's start with formatting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we, we are going to show some of the things here. So let's start with formatting. Is control alt f So we use this reformat code. These are the ReSharper shortcuts. You may use other tools as well. I like ReSharper. I don't, do any of you guys use ReSharper? How many of you guys do? At least, at least yeah, a couple three or back. four do. I recommend it highly. I believe it's one of the things given away in the raffle. Is that correct? So buy we, extra tickets. Win that. You have yeah. um, so first of all, that's how much brain power and effort you should ever put into formatting your code. So let's look at that in the full mode. At least that looks halfway decent now. Yeah. We still got some stuff to fix. To do that, you need two things. First, you need to agree on a formatting style for your team. People have very strong opinions about things. Indents, curly braces, all that stuff. But trust me, I have strong opinions as well. It doesn't matter. It is much more important that your code is consistent than your personal style. So get with your team, choose a style, it really does not matter what it is, then set your automatic formatter to enforce that style and stop thinking about it ever, ever again. Yeah. Let's use our brains on something that Worthwhile. brings value. Okay, let's go on. All right, so um, well, we're almost pushing two minutes, we're past, you guys are not keeping us honest. Give okay, us a run, run let's our, see that works. Does anybody expect us to fail now? That kind of stuff is, Never yeah. going to change how your code works. All right, Let's so let's start that. up here on line 11. So again, gray pointing out that we have this private string not being used. We can delete that. Shift delete will delete the entire line. Shift delete. Hey, it worked. All right. And now we have a nice comment. It's the vertical label names. This is for the variable vertical label names. Is anyone getting extra value from that comment? So we're going to get rid of it. And now it's actually easier to see that vertical label names is not being used. So now we can get rid of that. No as well. value, right? All right. Next, John says this is better than the old way. I wish we could take credit for like creating these comments, but really we just stole them from existing These codes. came from real things. <laughs> so who was John? He doesn't work here anymore. Nobody even remembers him anymore. What was the old way? And in what <laughs> way is this better? better? <laughs> Does it matter? Does that bring value? Does anyone think that brings value? Okay, that's what gone. Anyway? What's exactly. that? Exactly. And what is, <laughs> this? what is this? Yeah, I think we'll see some more examples of that, but you're really hitting on an important aspect of this. That wasn't bringing us value. All right. So now we have another thing, the string chart title, also not being used. And get rid of that. Now this is interesting. This is a class of type unit, <coughs> right? And it's the default units. So we have a unit, default units, not being used. We're going to get rid of them. How are we on time? Time to do another run. All right. Anyone think we've broken the code so far? This is one of the beauties of removing clutter when you start. It's very low danger. And it's really making it easy for us to read our code. I think you guys will all see that already. Probably, you know, it's not drastic yet, but I, I like this next one here. What is this comment about? So this is our constructor, and it returns landscape or portrait. How do you return something from a constructor? You don't. So well, what's going on with this comment? in the wrong place me it's in the wrong place definitely <laughs> this is an orphaned comment this comment is no longer goes to this method uh, I know we're on a time limit can oh. we ask questions yeah, yeah of course yeah, please do while we're doing that yeah no. no just go on uh, okay um, 
This kind of exercise seems like something that I would do a month or two into a project, not the very first time I get there, because usually I have to solve the problem and get out. And so I don't have time to do this stuff that you're doing right now. I have to find out what the issue is and address it. Well, so, so we don't take that approach, but it will be easier to talk about why after. So let's. Just, I'll, I'll okay. come back to that question, I promise. Okay. But after we've had a little more experience. Okay. All right. So um, let's delete that comment. It's been orphaned. This is weird. I find that co uh, programmers are more likely to delete code than comments. I don't know why. It's because they don't want to have to understand the comments and to figure out whether it went with that block of code. Good. Yeah, I mean, there's probably a lot of other reasons, too. But we start just not looking at the comments. What about this here? Comment is gone. It's easy to see that doesn't do anything. This does not do anything. Oh, or blank comments. The nice thing about these comments is you probably didn't have to spend time writing them. Those are probably auto-generated for you. Uh, so again, we have another thing of unit, horizontal naming. But this is a private function. It's not being called. We can get rid of it. Alt-delete will delete it for us. Oh, let me see that happen. Alt you have to be on horizontal naming. Are you in here? Yeah, uh, no. There, yeah. There we go. Alt delete. Confirm it is, move. but but more to the point, it's not being used. It's utterly useless at this point. That that rule wouldn't that necessarily rule always useless. apply if you are working in an API where you're exposing methods. If they're they, public, the editor will not show them as yeah. unused. Okay. Period. So, yeah. They have to be private. We have a lot of let's we need go to run around this. We have a lot of confidence in in this tool that it's going to tell us when it's something we can't delete. If it's public, it won't do that. All right, let's uh, go on. If you're using high reflection, the bets go off. So, okay, so here we're on here uh, for a method I and IDS. Well, first of all, even before we get to that, let's start here. We have these three uh, variables on 250 or parameters. 25, 26, 29. Those parameters are not in our method signature. So these are orphaned again. So let's get rid of those. They're either there because somebody's thinking of putting them in or took them out at some point, but either way, they're useless. Now we have two more parameters. These are actually in there, but you'll notice that they have nothing in them. So still, just clutter. Finally, we can see, shows the chart for I and I DS. Now, does that provide value? Unfortunately, yeah, because they're such a bad name. So, if you get a better name, you don't need that ridiculous now, name. It's possible that this is a lie, <laughs> yeah. right? But it's also possible this provides value. Don't delete the stuff that has value. We're going to keep that around. Change by Sally. Oh, that's another good one. I've seen this kind of thing a lot. There's a reason people do this. First of all, Robert wrote this, yes. and he's blaming it on Sally, right? No, not necessarily. No, no. So this is a lot of CYA, though. Either you're trying to protect yourself or take credit or have something to fill in. There's a good way to track what's been changed and who did it. What is it? Source control. Good. Source Comments control. are bad source control. So one of the things we said is that good warriors have good tools. Source control is one of those tools. You should be using it, and you should be using it appropriately. Comments are not good tools. Go ahead and run the tests. Good. All, All right, right so that goes away. Let's go down. We have some blank comments again. Those are easy to delete. Now this is an interesting on size change. Now this is not dead code. This is a method. This is being called. This is being used. It's overriding the method underneath it on size change. And the only thing it does is call the method underneath it. So it's useless code. But it's not dead code. It's just useless. We're still getting rid of it. Doesn't bring value. Here we have some empty comments. Let's get rid of those. Now this is really interesting. Unit. Never used. Do you remember I started by saying we had a variable of type unit? It was used at the beginning of this exercise. We deleted some dead code. It begot more dead code. You would be surprised how much of your code base is supporting other parts of your code base that is not being used. So I would say we get rid of that altogether. Yep. Uh, alt delete again. Remove empty files. Sure, whatever that means. Let's run our tests and find out I didn't screw anything up. We're happy. Good. Good. All right. 
We have an empty summary again. Render the chart background. That might provide value. We're going to leave it. I'm going to move it over, though, cause just because our formatter wouldn't do it for us for some reason. <coughs> so let's go on down. We're doing some pretty, really simple things. Well, there's uh, another good one. Well, there's a lot of things weird about this. So what's going on here? What is this called? Linking up to your ticketing system. Yes. Yeah. Which formerly is called bug tracking. Comments are not a great way to do bug tracking. What's really good for bug tracking? <laughs> bug, bug trackers. trackers. <laughs> Which we had a t-shirt we could throw on. <laughs> <laughs> so again, use the appropriate tool. This is not really telling you anything. It's not telling you what changed. and not telling you when it changed. It's not even telling you if the thing underneath it is even related to the change that was originally made. Use uh, your tra bug trackers. They will tell you that stuff. The they will integrate with your source control. They'll give you minor rich thing and accurate information. I want to point out, a lot of people say, well, we want comments in there so it clarifies things. This clarifies nothing. Org rep team missing rec chart. Everything's been, you know, abbreviated. And if, you're, if your comments are going to be helpful at all, if it is ever actually needed, make them really clear and easy to understand. This one's useless, and I say... Like we just said, it goes away. Oh, uh, you made a run? Sorry. I oh. hit it early. There we go. All right. Success. Okay, cool. Let's keep going down. All right. To do. Let's go up here. To do yeah. as a general rule are not that useful. They generally are not used, but let's read it anyways. We might need this back after the conference. Why did they do this? Followed by a big block of commented out code. Why do we do this? Demos. It was for a demo. Yeah. They didn't want the salesperson clicking on something that they knew had a good chance of causing a problem. Why didn't they comment it back or uncomment it out when they came back? Well, who knows? Yeah. But we obviously probably didn't need it. Even worse, if I uncomment this code, what are the chances it's going to compile? <laughs> Much less work. Yeah. Zero. Zero. So this is source control and our comments again. What's a good tool for source control? <laughs> source control, not comments. So it, this is actually interesting to me. When I go into a place, I can actually delete comments that are code faster than I can delete comments that are English. If I see comments in this thing that are code, I can delete those without thought. If it's English, I at least have to read the English to see if it has some value. You know, I, I want to point out just a quick little thing about this as well. I have worked on code where the people will read the commented out code while they're working on it to try and figure out what was trying to go on in this. So this, the whole issue here is that the code is so complicated, but each time we go in to touch it, we're rereading stuff that probably doesn't even work anymore, trying to make sure we're not screwing something up further. So this can become a nightmare world to live in where you're reading a bunch of really hard to understand code every time you've got to do a simple fix. It turns our simple fixes into nightmares. And the odd thing is, I've seen people doing that. They're reading this stuff that's in the comments to say, to see, well, maybe we need to just bring that back into a living state. That's a waste of time. So what do we do with all this? Delete we it. by now, yes. Look at this trick, though, that's in the middle of this. If our tools didn't clearly show us that's live code, I might have missed that. Guess what? In the past, I did use to miss those every now and then. Uh, Time. So, so let's go ahead and run it. This is about the two minutes, though, by the way. I only worked on half of this little problem. I could stop right now if the boss came in and said, I got this thing you got to go do. I still got better code. I still have better code. So let's go on. And the kinds of things the boss is going to come and have you do might distract you from this for months. I've seen that happen. Yeah. You know, we just stop. Well, let's check it in. We know it's going to work. All right, let's finish this out. We shouldn't get this. I love this comment. How many of you have seen this comment somewhere? <laughs> yeah. If I had a time for every time I saw that. So the reason you have this comment is because somebody got it. <laughs> yep. And they think they probably fixed whatever it was, and now they, they put that in there. So anyone's ever debugging through it again, they're going to go and say, oh, geez, we shouldn't be getting this. I guess. So let's delete it. Okay. Give us a run. Oh, yeah, let's do that. Dang, we're on top of it now. All right, so now we have on closed. Again, this is useless code, overriding but not changing. And a couple empty. 
Look at that number there. How much did we lose? About 100 lines, or maybe about a third of it. A third of the code. This is a little bit below what I see in average. On average, I see 40% of a code base is cluttered. Now, was that easy to do? Yeah. Now, I'm no. going to ask you an obvious question. I know we're not really looking at this very much, but this does this feel easier to read now? Honest opinion, guys. Sure. To me, it feels a lot easier to read. So do me a favor. Run our tests. Run our tests. Passing. Good. So let's go to our thing. Well, we've been saying two minutes to check in. This is a good point to check in. So let's actually do it. Uh, no, no. Uh, go to the Explorer window. This. No. What's, what's the Explorer window? Go to here. <laughs> I don't know what that is. And now go to there. I have to say that you guys are kind of cheating from what we would normally come into because you already have passing unit tests 90% of the time. We'll talk about that a so little bit. Passing unit tests are good, but honestly for what we just did. Yeah, it doesn't matter. We're well, still in the border of safety. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I, and I do want to take it a step further. The environment that this project originally was in had no unit test environment, and we had to do all this work by hand, which means we had to have complex manual tests. Mm -hmm. It was a nightmare. But we still cleaned the code and made it where it was easy to work with. Nowadays in that environment, there actually are some unit testing frameworks, and it makes things a little bit easier to do. So we're check going to check this code in. We're going to make a new branch for so it. So let's call it Inland Empire. Inland. So, so this is kind of hypothetical because you're starting off with a decent set of tests that you're running against. But so the tests right now are not the thing that's allowing us to work. So far, it's and not what's allowing us to work. And we would argue, learn to write quick tests around your stuff. That's a whole other talk. Yeah. It's not for this talk. So I get a. But uh, you can do manual this. tests, and you can do safe stuff like this. So what do we want to have for a name? Uh, so let's just say deleted clutter. That means run the application. Yeah. they're not yeah. great, but it's better than not running the application. Yeah. Okay. So commit to create, create, create branch. You want to create branch? Uh, yeah, create the branch. All right, and get some close. stuff, and we can close that. Uh, let me say something real quick about that. So I've worked in these environments over and over. Um, a couple years, three years ago, I was on a project that was uh, a huge Visio project that would create tremendously large files. I was able to still write tests for that within just, with having a nice framework to do it, within just a, a few minutes, really. And I would run those tests every morning to capture the current state of things, work on my code through the day, running the tests frequently, and the next morning I'd recreate the tests, or I should say that the approvals of the tests. So. To understand this properly, we can find ways to do it, and we do need to find those ways. But the clutter itself, we can almost always remove without worrying about. Now, what we just did was pretty quick. I've done a lot more. I've actually gone to a project where I spent an entire week removing clutter. All right. <coughs> Started the week with 80,000 lines of code in the project. Ended the week with 47,000 lines of code in the project. That was time well spent. Right? This is, uh, you guys have a great book club here. This is Beginning SQL Server 2012 Programming. About how many lines of code is that? So think of each sentence as being a line of code. How much? No, 50,000. 50,000. Anyone else have an idea? It's about 20,000 lines of code. Now, one of the things I advocate you should do is find out how, how many lines of code are in your own project. TFS will tell you, source monitor will tell you. That's what I deleted in a week. Now you said like you're always under pressure, and I agree, but it takes me about a week just to read this. To read yeah. it, not, not even really to read and understand, just to read. And then to read and then have to ignore. Code on average is read about 15 to 20 times more often than it's written. That week that I spent, I will get back another 20 weeks of not reading that code again. That's where the time starts to pay off. And it doesn't take much to get you there because you're usually working in some focused area of the code. You don't need to remove that much yep. to get the area you're working clean enough to work on. I think we can even take that a big step further, and that is that what you learn as you clean code usually leads you to the understanding you needed to spend time getting anyways. Now, we haven't gone to that step in this demo yet. No, but we'll but come back to that yeah. concept. Well, let's yeah. go back to our slides for a second. Yeah, I repeat myself over and over, by the way. So, yeah, you got to put up with that. 
So we went through this. Yep. And you saw we deleted all the stuff. Formats, comments, dead code, unnecessary code. I want to give you an idea. We fixed a, fixed a few of these things, too, if we were keeping track. An idea of what we've just done. This is Where's Waldo. It's a little bit better. It's a little bit better. One more time. Really? That's, a, that's about 30%. We might have gone a little overboard. We might be one click. Just notice it already feels better to look at. It's more spacious. It feels more comfortable. Right? That's about what we just did to our code. Now, I used to think that what the whole goal here to do was to continue on this pattern. Keep getting everything down so that playing Where's Waldo became trivial. Wouldn't that be a lot more fun? You just open the book, open up, there he is. There he is. So the thing there about Where's is. Waldo is it is fun. It actually is fun to have all the... But this paying is better. your programmers to do this is not fun. It's not a good use of money, and it's not fun. Find the bug is not fun. Where's Waldo? Fun. Find the bug? Suck. But this is not what I believe is happening. It took me a while to really understand the power of cleaning this code. Because I always thought, well, can I just grep for that? This is what I now believe is happening when you delete the code. There is a pattern in here. Can you spot it? Let's remove the clutter. Can you spot the pattern now? That's now why I delete the clutter. There are patterns in your code, pieces of your code that your code wants to tell you. It wants to talk to you. You can't see it in the clutter, even though it's there. I had a project, they had a lot of reports, it was like A, A 2010, B, two, B 2010, C, C 2010, D, D 2010. You can sort of see a pattern here. I had all these reports, so I started searching through the code to find out which reports were actually being called. And when they weren't called, I deleted them. And after I had deleted all the reports, I ended up with A 2010, B 2010, D 2010, E 2010, F, G 2010. That was a pattern. That's me going to the accounting department and saying, hmm, is there something wrong with your F report? And they said, yes, you've only been here a day. How did you know that? <laughs> because when I deleted it, the code spoke to me. And I fixed it by literally just using the other report. I mean, the reason we check this in is because we can uncheck it back out. And I didn't know what the report did, and I fixed it. They had already fixed it. They just forgot to wire it out. The code wants to talk to you. It has valuable knowledge in it. When you remove the clutter, it can. It makes it a lot easier to talk to the code and understand the code. So next we're going to talk about removing complexity. So we've gotten, we've taken care of the stuff we can do really easily. Removing complexity starts to being a little bit, we've got to be a little more cautious here, but it's still easy to do. Yeah. So let's see what we've got. We talked about bad names, long methods, we're going to talk a lot about those. So Bob Martin has a great saying about long methods. Long methods are a great place for classes to hide. <laughs> I think that is just a great saying. And I see it over and over. This project had tons of that. And we'll see a little bit of that today. Deep conditionals. Magic numbers. Those literals we were talking the about. Hard-coded constants. Improper variable scoping. Missing encapsulation. Obscure code blocks. Now... Now that we've taken care of the clutter, we can start doing this. You'll notice what we're about to do is going to become a little more dangerous. That's one of the other reasons to get the clutter out of there first. So we're back in this environment? Uh, yep. Go back to our... All right. All right, so uh, let's start the timer back up. And we're going to start at the top. So first we have this string, JJD. Uh, Woody, do you have any idea what that means? Um, no. All right. That's okay. We are looking for better code. We're not looking for perfect code. If we can get it, we get it. If we can't get it, we move on. Uh, we have CT. Does that mean something? Yeah, to you? that's our chart type. All right. So we're going to do a rename. Rename is F2. Well, I'm just typing a little too fast. By the way, these shortcuts, you can download them all off the net. I suggest you do. They have a nice little PDF you can just print. Get resharper so that a lot of these things work. are there for you. Yeah. 
But Rename is even in Visual Studio. So where I work, I manage a team of programmers. It's the day after I got there, I took my own personal credit card, and I ordered ReSharper for everyone, and then went and cold told the boss, he's got to reimburse me. Okay? Because it makes no sense for us not to buy the tools we need. Now, we should mention we're, we don't get any money from the ReSharper people, although we should. Yes. Pay yeah. attention. We uh, should. But, 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 but really you clearly, used to work in the sign thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the sign shop. And you used to tell me that, like, People in the sign shop, they would pay 200 bucks just for a brush that would help them to paint the signs better. Every, pay, every sign painter has his own kit, and there's going to be some brushes in there that cost a lot of money. When you talk to plumbers or automobile, like, they have their tools, and they pay good money for those tools. I'm surprised. Like, if your company will buy you tools, get them to buy your tools. No reason to spend your own money. But if your company will not buy you tools, don't not have the tools. Invest in your own self. For your own peace of mind, yeah. really seriously. I don't know how many. Uh, uh, we're, yeah, yeah, yeah we, need to run. Run we don't. I don't know how many times I bought ReSharper at different jobs just so that I would have it and I didn't have to sweat through this kind of stuff. I want these tools to make it easy. But let's go on. That yeah. renaming we got. Now you get that with with Visual Studio as well. Yeah. But I don't. And I don't know what 2012 has. Maybe some other refactorings. Uh, yeah, I think some more, but not as many. Still, okay. Still be a bit so let's behind. go on. Let's find some more to so fix. Show the chart. So uh, does this method actually show the chart? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's the draw. It calls draw chart. This is the uh, public interface to this thing. Yeah, that's what it does. So let's rename I and IDS to show chart. What? So now that we've done that, we now have stepped back to clutter. Now we have clutter. Did I screw this up? Good. So now let's remove the clutter. We no longer need our comp. It's redundant. Oh, and look at this. CT equals C chart. That's also our chart type. Let's fix that. Jeez. So right. better than an empty comment that says CT is a useful parameter. JJGQ05. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're telling it the chart type, and we're telling it... Well, I'm still not sure what that is. Well, but it equals the JJD. Ah, uh, yes. So, again, we're looking for better code. Two confusing names is worse than one confusing name. Let's have one confusing So which one do you want? Do you want the JJD this or is the... This is JJD. Okay, so let's rename that to JJD. Interesting Casey. convention, isn't it? And what's that last Boolean that we have on here? Oh, yeah, it's B. <laughs> All right, uh, well, let's look at the code. What does B do? It, if it's B, it shows the dialog. So let's call it should show dialog. Again, the code, if it is existing, is your spec. It is more important than what it was supposed to do is what it does do. Excellent. So right. name your variables to match. Should show dialog. Let's run our code. See that we're still good. We are. Good. So now we have a little thing down here on the graphics G. We just have it separated. So I, I want to put those together. Uh, there's a quick fix, which is Alt-Enter. And it gives us some choice of things we can quick fix. Yep. So it's I'm very join dependent this. on where your cursor is. That's Good. a stylistic thing, but this is, this is a nice uh, thing to follow. It just shows we're creating this object and holding it. Instead of we're creating this object, hold that in your head, and then we'll go down some lines and do something with it. All right, so I did that with the next one. Good. All right. Now we have this draw chart. Okay. So let's just take a quick scan through this method. Starts at 48. This is a big method. 173. So we're going to go through and we're going to break this out. But first, there's a couple things I saw as we scrolled by. Let's go up. So that right there, hold on. So uh, you see this chart type equals 150? Right. So that's a magic number, right? Those are our hard-coded values that we were showing before. Let's pull that out. So we're gonna pull this out with extract field, which is con uh, control alt D. So guys, there are five occurrences of this number in this code. How many of those should I replace right now? Should I do all five? Well, you can't be sure they all represent the same thing. Right. Exactly. So, like, just 
line. That's the trouble with magic numbers. We can't know that they all represent the same thing. When you search on something like 150 in your code, especially in a large code base, how many 150s are you going to find and how many of them are going to be related to the same purpose? Very few. That is really a problem sometimes. That's why we don't want the magic numbers. We want to know what it was for. So let's go ahead and do one occurrence and let's give it a, a reasonable name. So let's see. So it's something to do with chart type. Chart type ID. It is the... I'll just say chart chart 150 for right now. Okay, so say, just, just name it chart type. So at the very least, now it's a magic number that we know has something to do with chart type. Okay. It's better. It's not good. That's why we said two minutes to better code, not two minutes to good code. We're trying to make it just a little better. Okay, but I noticed something else here too, is we've got these um, literals here like this. Oh, look at that, there's one of those guys. Okay, so that is the chart type 150. Oh, look what, it's the bar charts. It's the bar charts. Oh, okay. So first, so of all, first let's put it to the chart type 150. <coughs> and then let's we can run that, see that we're still working. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because we went over already. You guys wake up. You guys, we want you to help us. So we pass. Now let's rename this so to chart rename. type bar. And that's so cool to have these tools that let us do renames. And it's nice to work in C sharp. And now we know that at least, whoa, that is not what we want. Rename that again. <coughs> chart type bar. Sorry about that. All right. And we have another literal right there. All right. Do you have any idea what that is? Well, now I know what this is. This is our report type. So let's no, no, name that display type. Let's so we have it to display type. Yeah, display because we change it to display types after a while. So you want to change this first to display type. Display type. Okay. Excellent. So I do that wrong. Hit enter. Yeah. No, just enter. Hit enter. Okay, and now we have a display type RPFLL. So I'm let's go ahead and run my test because I'm okay. not too confident in myself. There it is. Cool. All right, so we want to turn this into a constant. Is yeah. that what you're saying? So refactor D. And now, four or one? Four. This is a more obscure magic number, more likely that it's going to mean the same thing. So let's replace the four, and we can do display type. And do you know what kind of display type this is? The FLL, we kind of meant that to be full. Full, okay. So that's the old-fashioned big ones. Display type All right, full. and we're going to do the same thing, make it public, and we did it. So I saw another one of those here. Let me see where it was. This one, too. Should we do that oh, one? Display type, yeah. So this is probably split. Let's call it split. Okay. I don't know why I see code like this all the time, but eventually they start making more meaningful names, and they're no longer consistent. It's nice that the more meaningful names are useful, but it's hard to figure out the ones that are no longer consistent. All right. All righty, cool. All right, give this a run. Let's see that it works. So we really haven't done anything too drastic, and our tools give me a lot of confidence that we're not going to break things when we're doing renamings and things like that. All right, let's go. What do you want to do now? To the top. All right, so we still have the problem. This is a very large method. And before we break this up, I want to talk about the process. What I see a lot of people do when they refactor is this. They say, let me understand this code. Let me see where I want to take this code. And then let me figure out a path to get there. That is a very ineffective way of doing refactoring. We because think there's a better way. You're never going to get enough time to really understand the code, really understand where you want it to go, and then figure out a path. Yeah. That technique takes a lot of time that you're never going to get. What we're going to show you is a different technique. We're going to show you how to cut up code that you don't understand and figure out what it means later. So, one of the best ways to cut up long methods is curly braces. They are very, very encapsulating by their nature. So let's go up here and you'll scroll down until we find our first curly brace. There, on the if. So, uh, we have a shortcut to grow. So if we put our cursor inside of the curlies, Grow, 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 grow. Grow a little bit more. Grow. Scroll down to get the little bit. Now grow one more time. Anything else? So now we've grown. And afterwards, we're just going to extract it as a method, which is refactor m. You got it. What, right. want, what, what should we call this? Render uh, chart, render background? chart background. 
It might not be true, but it's better than what we have so far. It's done. I'm going to run the test. By the way, it's worth noting that um, most most schemes, whether it's Visual Studio, be Sharper with the Studio, even other editors, have a keyboard shortcut for refactor. And this time, it's Control Alt. So refactor method is Control Alt M. Refactor constant is Control or field is Control Alt D. Refactor uh, end line is going to be Control Alt N. It's easier to remember this stuff if you recognize the pattern in front. It's just, it makes it less than random keys. Okay, our code runs. Uh, it runs. Okay, let's see this. Oh, uh, reset the thing. All right, so we have, uh, now it's easier to read. So we have brush. I'm sorry. Uh, then that brush gets given back by the render chart background and then disposed of. So the brush is useless. So the brush is useless, yes. But notice that it's easy to see that the brush is useless now. We did it wrong. So we pulled out on the curly braces, and when we did that, it allowed us to see that we needed to pull out slightly bigger. We have a scoping problem. Someone mentioned that earlier. Yeah, scoping problem. But this is how you work. You change it, it shows you, it talks to you more, it shows you more things, then you fix it. So we're gonna undo what we just did, and now we're gonna start at brush, go all the way down to the dispose, and now we're gonna pull that out as a method. And again, what was it? Uh, Render chart background. So on our tests, you play with the code. It tells you some more. You respond to what it tells you. All right. All right. And I don't have to understand. I still don't know what happens inside that method, but at least I know that that one variable belongs inside it. Now this guy has become redundant. It's clutter, right? So he goes away. We got some more curlies here. So let's grab those and throw them out. All right, extract it as a method. Check this out. ReSharper is actually telling us what we should call the method. I don't know how it does that. But kudos to ReFactor. So I called it get data. Good. Oh, 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 but that's no good. Scroll yep, a little it's bit. no good. Okay, so first of all, out is a smell. Out is a horrible, horrible language feature. Well, I'm going to show it never that have still been works. introduced. That's what we did. Oh, and we broke a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. All right, undo that. Out's no good. We won't talk too much about that right now, but run it again. Let's see that we're back to work. We're past. Good. All right. So, out was brought about because of the need for com interrupt. There were better ways they should have done it. They didn't. It's not really the issue. The issue is that you should not be introducing it to your code. So, consultant, how am I supposed to deal with this? So the reason you use out or ref, for that matter, is because you have more than one thing you need to return from your method. So return something that holds more than one thing. You can use a tuple, you can use an array. In this case, we have three things. Let's just pull that out as an object. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, run our test, make sure we're passing. We did just run. You're about to see some severely dangerous refactoring. Yeah, so we're, this is gonna be hand coding. Up so until this point, we have only used automated shortcuts and delete. Now we're getting to serious business. All right, so first we're gonna highlight 57 through 59. Uh, actually, okay. So cut that. And we're going to replace it with an encapsulated object called foo. Foo equals new foo. Good. Let's create that class. Shortcut for doing that. Boom. There it is. And make that public for me. I'll make it public for you. Next, I'm going to paste everything into here. And then I'm going to use my block select. Let me pick this up first. Then do this. So this is so alt, drag. Alt, drag. And paste. Good. So now I have a whole bunch of public things. I've encapsulated the three things I need to return into an object that holds all three. But you'll notice on the side there's a whole bunch of red. This is your compiler nagging you, hey, you broke stuff, you broke stuff, you broke stuff. This is useful. Let's go to where we broke stuff. Put foo in front of it. Foo. 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 I think we did it. I uh, still have some red sitting there. 
scroll down a little bit more, still some red. So you notice I can tell by the little box up in the corner that we still have problems. More foo, more foo, more foo, still a piece of red at the front of that, more foo. Run the test, so run the run test. Run our test, because that Boy, was woo. just under two minutes of the most dangerous refactoring we will do all night, ladies and gentlemen. Yay. <laughs> I will, right. I will make a point did we, here. Did we run? Did we pass? Yep, we just did. Good. I'll make a point here. I, I have practiced this enough where I could do everything we're doing here in about 12 minutes. So, but, but the point here is that even these dangerous points where we come to these, it's a really easy to just do an undo to get back out of the thing. Yeah. That's, that's, these tools are fantastic. All right, so okay. now let's go down and look at that foo object we just created. Oh, all righty. Let's guy? see what it's telling us. What is this foo object containing? What would be a good name for it? Better than foo. Data, some other data. Let's rename it to data. Or data, depending on where you are from. So good. Oh, yeah. And so now let's go back up to where we were. Control minus will take us back. Scroll up. So now you can see Resharper even realized that we named our foo foo and changed it to data. Now we can extract that method again with no refs and no outs. So, so we'll, we'll just grab all the way from there. Now let's start with the data. With he, from here. Yeah, yep. from there all the way down to the end of the if. These these are called um, seams, seams, I think. So yeah. let's just we uh, know what that is. So what do you want to do here? Is extract very method? easy ways to rip apart code. Find the seams. And we're using the little curly braces to guide us without understanding what's going in there. So, so let's run our code. See that it works? Still working, right? All Good. right. So we got another seam here. Let's rip that apart. Pull that out. But it looks like you're also looking inside the seam to see if data definitions that have preceded it are actually used inside that section of code. No. But what you just did to create the full object we ripped out the seam, and then when it was ripped out, we could show it. Us, he showed us we had a problem. To and fix. the same with the brush. We didn't know about the brush ahead of time. Once we ripped it out, we could see the brush. We're usually, still not looking inside. I still don't yeah. know what's going on inside. Usually, when I'm doing cleaning like this, I'm really just trying to get, and we'll see in a second. I'm trying to get a method that is very clear to read, and we're going to see that in just a second. And it, it, we just let the code tell us no, what I we need to do to do it. It just looked like you were going outside the curly braces for data elements. But I yeah, we were, but after we had pulled it okay. in. So let's go ahead and do this one. So this is foo again, right? We don't sure, know yet no what that does. Okay. All right. So Run our test. Let's see that we're going. Oh, yeah. And we got one more set here of some curly braces. Let's we're get this try. out. Yeah, so let's grab that whole try block. Uh, so I don't know what this try block does, but it, if it does anything, it invalidates. So let's pull it out and just call it invalidate if needed. Oh, okay. No, please do. So if it needs to, it will invalidate. So I'm fine with that. Let's run this. Good. Okay. And what I want to look at now... Oh, go ahead. You have no, something no, you want to say? I, you're absolutely right. What I want to look at now is what this original, very complicated method looked like. Now, it's still got a little sloppiness up here we're not going to pay too much attention to. But when we get down here, it renders the chart background, it gets the data, and then it foos, and then it val invalidates if needed. What do we think foo does? Probably draws the chart. Probably draws the chart. Let's rename that. Draw the chart. Now, that's your code speaking to you. That's us not even looking inside the method and knowing what the method's supposed to do. Does this make sense, guys? We're not sure it really does that, but if it doesn't, this thing probably wouldn't work at all because it doesn't do much else except invalidate. So let's run this. So let's run works. it. And there's a name for this. I learned this a long time ago from Martin Fowler's book. This is called composing a method. I've composed this method to make it almost read like a paragraph or a sentence. I'm going to render the chart background, and get well. First, this little chunk—if we abstracted it out—we might call this, you know, initialize 
background or initialize draw area or something. Sort of area. We could do that, but then we would render the chart background. We would get the data. So let's do that. We Pull those three lines out. Oh, you want to do that? I can yeah, do that. Oh, wait, hold on. First of all, uh, this.jjd is the display type. Let's rename that to display type. And actually, this is now redundant code. You can get rid of that. Get rid of this because we already have this at the at a, a higher scope. Is that yeah, right? we're passing it in so we're for whatever you need it on that. So now okay. it's just graphics and clear. So we can turn this into a method, you're saying? It actually doesn't help us very much. It goes two lines to one line. We're okay. Okay. All right, so I want you to check in. Let's check in. Okay. So we're not first done with all, all the, the tests complexity or yet, but we've gotten through a lot of it. Okay, I'm going to run the tests, and yep. they all passed. That's cool. reset. You wanted to do a check-in. Yep. So go to the Explorer. That's uh, this guy here. Which Fine. guy? Yep. And right-click on the red, and HG commit. Uh, so now we've broken apart the long method. Right? And again, people always ask us, when are you done? There's no done. We're done when the timer runs out. Hopefully, we'll be in a very happy spot there, but there is always better. And you don't always get to the better. There's a lot of your code base that's legacy code that works, and you don't need to touch it. And don't. Touch the stuff that you're working on. There's too much to touch. Again, if that book is 20,000 lines of code, most projects I work in are 100,000 to a million lines of code. You can't rewrite all of that. You have to choose your battle. I guess, I guess that was my earlier comment. Well, so we're touching this file. But, but, okay, so, so, so we're so going to this file. We didn't go to the other the files. Scope, this is what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. In any file you're touching, you're assuming danger. Right. That's the nature of touching a file. All right. All right. So, um, I think we're about an hour in. Let's take a small ten-minute break. Give people a chance to stretch their legs. And then we'll come back and we'll attack the rest of this code. Does that sound good? Sounds good to me. All right. Everybody refreshed? It's good. We're back. We're awake. Good. So let's go on. So we've been doing better. I think everyone would agree. If we went home right now, our code's in a better spot than it was an hour ago. Yeah. But we're still not, we're still not, I, I don't, there's still a lot more to go. So I want to go, we just pulled these methods out. We never looked at them. Let's go look in some of these methods and see how they look. Which one do you want to look at? Uh, well, let's do the first one at the top. Yep. So we start up the timer, and so the first one is draw, okay, and draw chart is render chart background. So let's That's go what to you that. Okay. Yep. All right, so here you can see uh, that 150, didn't we have a chart type 150? We, sh we do. Well, we changed that uh, even. It's so, now chart type bar. Okay. Cool. All right. Let's run that. See if it works. So here we render the back. We have another if. So let's pull that out. So you want to go on this one here? Yep. It looked like you were using another sharp or feature or CTB. Uh, oh yeah. So that's actually not just through sharper. That's um, Visual Studio will do it too. But it's the camel case. Right, so you can you don't need to type you, if you're typing more than three letters in Visual Studio, you're doing it wrong. Right, just type the capital letters of the camel case, and it will fill in everything else. And that allows you to use long names, but type short ones. It's really quite great. I got a question. Yeah. So whenever you go in and do this refractoring uh, and you pull out the stuff, your next thing is to look at what you pulled out and not to start at the top of the yeah. file. Yeah. Look at what we just pulled out and say, hey, what happened? So we've already composed that method. We're now going to compose this method. So let's see what happens. We've, if, we've come up to here. To. If we need to. Well, yeah, as long as it's got nested ifs, that's something we might usually want to work with. So here, what we have here is we're going to do, if it's a bar chart, we're going to do this. So let's pull that out. And what's the if we're doing is rendering bar chart background. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And we have an else, so let's pull that out. Ah, ah, before we go, though. Oh, no, pull it out. You sure? Yeah. So you see, this method's too big to fit on a screen. 
So it's all ready to go. So let's get it so it can fit on our screen and see what it tells us. All right, so now it fits on the screen. We make a brush, we render a bar chart background, which gives us back a brush, or a pie chart background, which also gives us back a brush so we can dispose it. So now it's telling us that brush is goofy, right? How can, you say, how can you tell that? Because why would a method only give you back a brush so that you can dispose it? Why doesn't it dispose it for me? So let's undo what we just did. Um, how did you know that else means um, pie chart? Oh, I didn't. I knew it meant not bar chart. How did you? Oh, because we only have pie charts and bar charts. We only have pie charts. Woody pie is very talented. What about, like, the line chart? We haven't written it yet. Oh. Okay. That's actually our job is to write the line chart. I think you might so have missed that part. Okay. That, that is our job, but we're cleaning the code before we get there. So let's go ahead and fix this. This is improperly scoped, so I'm just going to bring it within scope. We're going to bring it into the scope here. And yes. let me make sure where I'm at. This else, right? Yep. Yeah. All right. And then and we have to get the other part. Which is this guy yep. here. And he has to be moved within the proper scope. Scoping gets clear when you do it this way. It wasn't so clear. So let's before. run it, see that that worked. Okay. It's passing. Now we can do our extractions because we're going to compose this method. All righty. Very simple stuff. So I probably would have called it render not bar chart. But then Woody would have looked at me and said, we only have bar charts and pie charts. <laughs> or render other background would also have been imperfect. Any of these names are better than the big block of code that we have here. And once you get it, then you can get the next name. All right? I used to care a lot about names. I still care a lot about names. So I no longer think about names a lot. So now, now I just use the best one I have. In the moment I have a better one, I refactor and use the better one. So now this this method is pretty clear. We can yeah. pretty we can look at this and it's pretty clear. Let's go on. Well, let's go back to that original method we had up at the top. So that's our draw. You know what? Uh, I should just put a holder there. But there we go. So that we can go to get data. Yep. Okay. Let's look at that for a moment. So if we have a bar, so we have another if block. Let's pull that out. We have that same scoping problem. Do we want to deal with that? Uh, so pull out the if block for a second. Let me see it. Get bar chart data. And scroll down a little bit. And get pie chart data. And return. Yeah, you're right. We have totally have that problem. Yeah, so let's undo that. Let's do that again. So if you have a really big monitor, you can sometimes see that right away, but usually can't because again, this was hundreds of lines originally. So we'll move the data up and go up there and move it. Up. So now we can do the same this, thing. Let's see that it works. It does. Cool. Now let's pull it out again. So again, you can see this is very easy, right? And it's okay that we try stuff. Notice that we do stuff and we do it wrong a lot. That's okay. Move the code, see what it tells you. A lot of times you're gonna be wrong. You're gonna be wrong because you haven't taken the time to read everything and understand everything. Because that's gonna take too long, you'll never do it. Play with it, see what it tells you, do it again. It's okay to make a mistake. You're it's an undo passing. away from it. All righty. Good. It's passing. So we got to so, go back up to that data guy. I mean, get draw chart method, and we'll go to the render next Render chart. All right. All right. So, hey, this looks familiar. All right. We're let's seeing a pattern, out. aren't we? So let's go ahead and do this one. It's the bar chart again. And this, what, what was this method called? This is render chart. Render okay. chart. So, so this, this is going to be render, render bar, bar chart. chart. Now, we're going to see something in a second here. But what I've often seen is that people make the decisions about, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. People make decisions about what this should do, and we're working kind of backwards. We're just getting it clean, and we're going to let it tell us what to do. I wanted to make a point of that. So let's save this. Let's, or let's run it, see if it works. All right, let's check this in. Let's go back to our slides. Yeah, because as you keep saying this, it's 
chart type this and that. It's like the natural right progression to put all that stuff into you know, a single uh, instant or it's probably a select case. We'll see how it pops out. Uh, so, uh, yes, compose more methods. <laughs> That's fine. Why are you doing, uh, committing? committing because we could check in and go home. If we stop right now, we have gotten value out of our code. This is better code than when we started at the beginning of the talk. Everyone agree with that? So sort of the point of this is that we can check this code in, and they can be building it right now, and we have a lot of confidence because our tests all run that we're not going to have broken anything. And, and that's the whole point is we can do rendering, we can do refactorings in very small pieces each day, and our code is always a little bit better every day. And people always ask, like, when are you done? You're never done. That's right. right? I, You're just done for now. I always like doing constant uh, check-ins because it gives you the ability to diff back to previous check -ins. That's a really yep, good point. That's another good thing. And if you're changing large swaths of code, then you don't have to worry about collisions if you do frequent check-ins. Oh, which you can revert if you have constant check-ins. You can revert easier. Uh, so let's go back to our slides. Okay. I've got a question. Yeah. Um, at what point, as you're writing code, do you stop and do the record? The moment that you see a better way. The moment you see a, uh, so something well, that's going across the Well, OK. When, for me, when I come upon something that's hard to understand, hard to read, I immediately will go to making it easy to read. Because, it, as you can see, matter of fact, can, let, let's do a... Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's do something here. That, what is um, it? M, 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 O? Is it... I don't know. Control, M, Control. Maybe I need to click in here. I'm not getting it to happen. Okay. You're I'm just getting not getting out. Yeah. Uh, okay. Maybe it's all... There it is. Okay, so let's ask that question that we want to ask. If we needed to add a line chart now, what do we need to do? So what are those Which methods? methods? What methods? Render pie chart. Yep. Get line chart, or render line chart, get line chart data, and render line chart background. Okay. We just need to write those three methods. So I asked you sort of the at the beginning, how long would it take you before you started to get a handle on it? We're not totally at a handle on it yet, but hopefully you've got a much better idea, right? So it's a really, if you don't understand the code, it's a great thing to do. Clean up the code as a method of understanding the code, you'll understand the code better, and you'll get the refactoring for free. The investment in the refactoring will pay off immediately right. in the time you would have spent understanding it anyway. So the next time you come to this code, you don't need to spend that whatever time it took you to understand it, because now you can just read it. Yeah. And it will reveal or express itself to you. That's what this is really about. It's writing code that expresses its purpose so we can read it easily. And it's possible at this point I had understand it enough that I might just go to run the run the light chart. Yep. But let's I go further. This code a little cleaner, so so go do you actually want to go back to these uh, slides? I do want to go back to those slides. Okay. So we've done complexity. We did the bad names, the <coughs> deep conditionals. We get to cleverness. This is a subtle thing. We're only going to spend a little time on it. But if it was simple and elegant, it wouldn't be referred to as clever. Clever is one of the things that feels good when you do it. It feels like you're being very smart. It actually feels like you're outsmarting people. But usually it's going to be you who's looking at this code next month, and the person you outsmarted is you. In my history, I have done some very clever things, and every single one of them has bitten me extremely hard later. Do things that are clear. Do things that are elegant. Do things that look simple. Clever? Clever is going to bite you. So uh, let's go and take a look. We're not going to cover those Well, things. no, I wanted to do one quick one. Oh, really? So let's go back to the code. Oh, you want to see this in the code? Yes. Yep. So, uh, expand those up again. Oh, it's is it control? Yeah. Now, you know, I keep getting us out of it. There we're back. All there right. You go. All right. So let's scroll up. Whoa. No, no. You've you've done the opposite. <laughs> what exactly do you mean by clever? Um, an example. So, uh, yeah. So one time I had a hash map, and I wanted to find stuff on it, but I had full objects, and I wanted to find it based on the number like an age. So I made it equal to an int. So I had a person that was equal to an int, and I could just go into my hash map and pull it out on the hash. Um, later on, for some reason, my people started acting really weird. Um, that would be because I used equal to do something it's not supposed to. That's common with equal. It's really, really common when you do operation overloading. 
Because most people overload an operator to make it do something other than what the operator Not is nothing. saying. Uh, Let's go ahead. wise manipulation is very clever. Anything that you desperately need to comment because you don't understand, clever. I had two lines of code once that did bitwise shifting and manipulation. I know what it did in the end. It sorted the objects, but I don't understand why. And I spent two hours trying to understand what it did on two lines of code. That's clever code. At the very least, encapsulated, which is what we're going to do right now. So if you scroll down to that big if statement, uh, up a little bit, This code is horrible. This if block, right? I don't know what this does. I'm sure it does it right, but I don't know what it does. But what happens if this is true? <coughs> Good. So what we're going to do is just encapsulate the cleverness. So go in there, grow until you get the whole inside, and pull it out as a method. Should invalidate. Now notice this method is easy to read. The cleverness nicely encapsulated into if scroll down a little bit. A little method that is still horrible, but this is like when you were a kid and your mom asked you to clean the room, right? And you just took a lot of the mess and you shoved it in the closet. That's okay. Take you know in don't the closet. Keep the big that mess is a great idea. I should with everything it. else. Yes. Okay, right there. That method, regardless, is invalidated. Oh, no, it's not. Only if it catches. No. Or if it... If, or it, if it should invalidate, it'll invalidate. Otherwise, it's going to pass out. Yeah. Doesn't matter, though. Okay. It only gets the catches if I, it throws I think this is really... A, you, you bring up a really important point. We do not need to understand this code as long as it keeps doing what it did before. That's, that's a big part of what these refactorings are about. But refactoring also, is the concept that we are improving the structure and the readability of the code without changing its behavior. When it's confusing at this, think of how un understandable it is when it's expanded out. Yes, very right? understandable. And, and this is the thing. Code is hard enough. Code is going to beat you up. It's going to make you make mistakes. Do everything to make the game in your favor. Don't Let's play in the very hard. Simplify that. Make your lives better. All right, so uh, back to the slides. So we did cleverness. Okay, so we've done uh, clutter. We did complexity. We did cleverness. Now we got the three Ds. What's one of the Ds? What do you need to get out of your code? The big rule. Display a chart. <laughs> That's true for this code, but not for all code. This is it. So this is sort of almost all, everything that you need to deal with is if you just remove duplication, you're getting better code. A lot of techniques will come out if you just follow the But remember, there's three Ds here. So what's another thing? Dependency. Dependency. Let's see. Yeah, I like that. No, duplication. <laughs> so what's, what's the, the third, third one? <laughs> if we just did this, our code would be so much better. So let's go take That's a look That's what we're going to take a look at. And we already have seen that. So let's uh, collapse all those methods. Okay. I'm, I'm going to start out the timer right. again. Are we passing, by the way? Sweet. Uh, I can run it. Yeah, Let me run it. Oh, and, okay. So we've been doing this two-minute timer this whole time. Right? I'm going to actually turn this off. Let's do a little bit better. We talked about tooling. Right? So what I want you to do is I want you to go and turn on InCrunch. Set by up here? Yep. Enable InCrunch. So, what is it? NCrunch is an automatic test runner. You see these green dots? That means that it works. Let's go and break something. Uh, just find C chart bar type 150. Let's change that to 151. Count one, two, three. Red. We broke something. Change it back to 150. Or one, two, three, four. We got about four seconds now. We'll know if we've broken our code or not. It runs even when we have not saved. It's pretty It'll cool, isn't it? So we're no longer going to work on the clock. We're going to in crunch do the crunching for us. Okay. So what are we going to do? All right. So let's go back to our first method. So oh no! Let, uh, let's collapse that stuff up. Okay. So do you guys see some duplication? 
Yeah. What do you see? Yeah. It's a main duplication. We have two things that kind of do the same thing in a different way. What's that called? Duplication. Duplication. Polymorphism. What's a good way to handle polymorphism? Inheritance. inheritance. Yes. We're going to do something very, well, inheritance, but a little bit slightly different. So, um, so the first is we need two objects, right, to polymorph. So let's start here. We have the, let's start at the top again. So what was that? Render bar chart. Background. The background. Okay. Render chart background. All right. So the first thing is we need two objects. So one object should probably be called a bar chart. Okay, it doesn't compile yet, so let's make it compile. And let's make that public. Okay. And we can see that things are working. It's all working. Good. When you add a class, will that ever break anything? So it's worth noting down here, this N being green also tells us all our tests are working. Right? If something breaks, that will also go to red. This thing here. Yeah. All right, so hard to break something by adding a class. Now, this render bar chart background, let's move that on to the bar chart. So F6 is move. Did I do that right? I think I did it wrong. Click on it and F6. All right. Yeah. All right. So bar chart. There it is. Just move that one. Um, actually, while we're here, render bar chart. Um, get bar chart data. We might as well move all of them. So we're running all. We're moving all the stuff that has to do with the bar chart to the bar chart object. They're all static methods, by the way, right now. Yeah, but make uh, make the access right as uh, no public. Good. Let's cool. make sure it runs. Oh, it is running. It is running because you can see actually here there was a small little circle running around and crunch got our back. Good. So. Now we've moved to the bar chart. Now, let's do pie chart. What was it you just did? Though? I, I, I ah, did. we'll watch this again. Okay. We'll do it with this one now, okay? Pie chart, chart. It was static. They're, they're made static automatically when we when we create them because we were passing everything in that, that they needed, and therefore they, they didn't need to be a member of the class. Right. And in fact, okay. you can't move a method from one place to another until it's static. And we can't, we can't do that anyway. So, yeah. Because the member variables from above. Alrighty, so we make right, one of those. So let's make that. So first thing we did is we created a class. Okay, let's go through this real slowly. We've made a new class, and it's we're making it public. So when we you later move it, it around in the corner, we're still good. Okay, Hard to break so we can go by back to where we class. were. And so now what I want is the methods that are related to the pie chart to be on that pie chart okay. class. I and since they're or, already static methods, we can move those easily. So, so let's go ahead and do that. And we got that guy. We got that guy, we got that guy, and we want to move them to pie chart. Oops, there it is. And, and we want to make them public so they, they're accessible. Again, we can run our tests, or they're already yeah, running. They're already I don't run. even have to do it. Well, let's anymore. go take a look at pie chart for a second. Okay, let's go look at pie chart. Yeah. In fact, let's, let's quick fix that. Let's move it into its own file. You want so, to move it into its own yep. file? Move to another file with the name to match. You want to do so now, that? So let's go look at it for a second. Yeah, so here's our pie chart. You can see it's running. We should be green in a second. There we are. Good. Scroll down. By the way, black means it's not run. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Green, green, green. We're happy. Our methods are all now encapsulated into pie chart. Let's go back up to our single ch our other file. And let's pull up bar chart as well. So now, oh, I gotta do a quick fix on. We've done an interesting thing. Let's save this. See it work? Green. Let's check it in. Is it is it it's saved already? When it's it saved that? already. Mm -hmm. uh, no, Control Shift S. So well, how can it be running it? It's running it without saving it. It runs it without saving. In Crunch is just that awesome. Cool. So uh, let's go and check in. Now this is going to be something different. First of all, notice we have more things that we are changing now. So let's change our thing to extracted bar chart 
and pie chart. Now at this point, this is still very hairy and not great. But just notice, even at this point, if I was to stop and now add a line chart, my chances of breaking bar chart and pie chart have gone down astronomically. Because I wouldn't even be in the file. The reason Woody got called in is because every time they tried to add line chart, they broke pie chart and bar chart. This is the kind of safety that you're getting. And we haven't even gone to the good refactoring yet. We've just moved it to a separate file. All right, so let's go back and let's do a little bit better. Because it is bar chart and we just moved it, let's actually put it on chart. So we're going to copy chart there, paste it here. It doesn't work because it's static. So let's go this real slow. What we are doing, we're going to use a refactoring by just dropping chart on there. It knows that this is no longer going to work because a static method is not a member method, right? We need to now move it into being a member method. We have a quick fix for it, so we're going to make it non-static. That turns it into a member. Now that can be called off of a chart object. You can't really get the polymorphism working with static methods. It just yep. doesn't work. To be polymorphic, it has so to be we have to do the same thing here. Is that what we want to do here? Yep. Same make story. Make it non-static. Now, I'm going to run that. Well, it's running, so never it's mind. Running. It's automatically proving to us that this is working. So but is that clear? Let's make sure that's clear. So everybody's kind of following along. Those who are still awake. All right. Does yes. Product mean the letter N followed by crunch? Yes. Crunch. Yeah, N okay. crunch. Okay. And yeah. would you consider that as, as vital to your work effort as we sharper? Not me. No. If I had to no. choose, I would go through sharper. No, I mean, but... Yeah. You really want when to. I am doing refactoring, I love InCrunch. Love it. Yeah. Well worth it. Because then you're not stopping to do this all the time to, yeah. to run this test. It, it's really pretty nice. It, it, when something isn't going to compile... And we're getting um, two-second granularity about something going wrong. That's just... If I can get something awesome. messed up here. For free. I start doing like that stuff like this. It, it won't even compile. It can't run those things. So it's... it's you, you, uh, I hit the wrong button. So it, it's pretty nice. It's it's running in the background all the time. Let's go in, on. In comment outline 117. Comment it out. What? Uh, it was free. It just started being paid like last month or something. Boom. Red. Because we goofed it up. Tests. Yeah, because now we have failing right. tests. So put those back to uncommented out. One, two, three, four. Woo, that was a long one. Like that's the kind of granularity I'm looking for in my test. Being temporal, run temporal granularity. 10, 20 times. Does that work based on previous defined tests? It figures out what's changed and runs the most impacted change first, but it will run all the tests eventually. And it does it in a separate thread. It's absolutely fantastic. All righty. All right, so now we have two things that could be polymorphic. But to be polymorphic, they have to be identical. These are not identical. These are similar. We need to change that. Render background. Does that make sense? And the other one, render background. Now they're identical. This name is a good name, render background. We don't need to even say chart anymore because it's render background of a pie chart, render background of a bar chart, right? Good naming conventions. Okay. Now we can extract a base class, but not a base class. We're going to extract an interface. Okay, so we so want to do. Let's go to bar chart and right click. There's no shortcut for this one. You got to say refactor extract interface. We could say an I bar chart, but really it's an I chart, not the I chart your doctor does. But why don't you do this on the other uh, shared methods as well? We will because okay. little steps. We so, kind of jumped ahead boom. a little bit around there. Place where to move. Place in another file. In Might another as well. file. Yes. So. Now we have, a, and we don't know that those, those methods are not identical yet. So we don't want to pull them out. And we don't know what we need to do to make them identical. Okay, so now this bar chart can be an I chart. Let's go to this pie chart and make it an I chart too. You want to do that right here? Yep, so I chart. And you'll notice it doesn't work because pie chart is not an I chart. So let's go and use our quick fix to make it an I chart. It gives us some different choices. We're going to choose the one that implements iChart. So now both of these are iCharts. And that means... I just ran the test. So I'm, I'm so automatically doing that. Okay, we don't need to because NCrunch is doing it. So now we can have the most fun of the night. Let's pull right. out iChart. So, 
let's put it up there and say chart equals bar chart. And now we don't have to redeclare it down on line 17. Am I doing that wrong? Uh, get rid of it there. Good. And we'll see it run and we see it pass. Good. Now, notice that in both of these cases with duplication, we can pull that outside of our if block. So we're red, runs again, we're good. Wow. Now it's a little clunky that we have this big if block. So let's go to our if and quick fix that into a nice ternary function. And now it's still goofy that we have the separation on the declaration, so let's combine those with another quick fix. So does that make sense to you guys? We just all we did was compress the if block down into a ternary, and then we we've combined the creation of the chart with its declaration. So Pretty I'm straightforward. Sure that hurts readability a little bit, putting on a It may yeah. seem that way. And the, and if we had a bunch more of these to do, we might want to find a different way. But essentially, we've invented our own little factory. Yeah. So and we can even pull here. this out as a factory. Yeah. But let's go ahead and take this a step further. Well, so now this method is kind of useless. We brought it out because there's a whole bunch of code, but now it's just two lines of code. So let's inline that, which is control alt in. So if we go back to our original method that was calling it, we now have that work being done here. But I'm sure you guys can all see that now that we have a chart, we can follow up with getting this guy into chart and getting this guy into chart. This decision gets made only once, right? So let's move So and this is also important. We pulled this method out. 40 minutes later, we pulled it back. That's how code works when you refactor. You're going to do something that gets you closer, and then you might undo it later when you can get closer yet again. So those of you who used to do manual refactorings, a great deal of what you did was exactly that. We had to go through a number of steps to do what these automatic tools so nicely do for us. Let's go ahead and do it. So get data. Let's inline that right away. Just do an inline on it. I did something wrong. There you go. So. Now we have our data. You can see this one. So first, bar chart. Same thing we did before. Oh wait, on. So first, sorry. So we already extracted these. Get bar chart data. Get pie chart data. Similar, not identical. Let's make them identical. So get chart data or get data. Yeah, I think get data is a bit. For me, that's a better name. And let's do the same thing with the other one. Maybe we don't get too picky about names. You can always change them again later. But the problem is, if your names are too a little bit out instead of a lot out, you kind of tend to leave them. So if you really don't have a good name, use a really bad name. I'm serious about that. Use a really bad name so you go, before I'm done with this, I'm going to change that because I don't want anyone to see how stupid I, I was. So do that. So okay. next, let's go. And we need a chart that's of type bar chart. But it turns out we have a chart that's of type bar chart. So let's go to our bar chart and cast our chart to a bar chart. Right here? Yep. So we want to do this yep. and say go I chart? No, oh no. Go bar chart parenthesis of our chart. Like so we so. know that the chart's a bar chart if we got to here. Parenthesis. I got you. Now it's going to complain because it was static. So let's make it non static. Cool. Now we can do the same thing for our pie chart. Well, I'm All just right. going to do it like this. Because it's not on bar chart yet. We can't add it to the interface. We're going to do that in a minute. We're going to let that. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so we're, we're going there. But there's a reason to do it so this not, way. Yeah. Yeah. There is a step in between. So let's let the tools do the most of the work for us. That's what it comes down to. This way, this seems backwards to a lot of people. Now that we've moved it from static to non static, we can delete the bar chart. This part. Yep. Yeah. And we can add it to the interface. Create it in I chart. Create method I chart get data. Good. Done. Go back to where we were. And now we can pull it out of pie chart. We'll get that for free. And now you'll notice that we're doing the same thing regardless of the chart type. So we can delete that whole if block. From here to all the way down to the next return chart. Two lines down. Here. Delete that and delete the next one. And then inline rep and inline that again because it's just getting put to data. So go on rep 
and refactor in. Uh, so I did a whole inliner. There we go. So now our chart renders the background and our chart gets the data. We're still working as InCrunch is telling us constantly. Let's do the last one. Inline render chart. Oh, just inline it. Yep. Well, I guess I can do that from here, too. You can do it from both places. And let's go back to where we were. So you'll see a very similar type thing. First, we need to make them identical. So render part by chart. Let's do render chart. Or just render. Render almost seems correct. Um, but OK, let's do that. What the heck? It really doesn't matter that much, does it? And render pie chart goes to render. We don't want to waste characters, do we? So we went from similar to identical, except we're not quite identical. <coughs> this has display type, three parameters. This only has two. So to make them identical, what do we have to do? Overload. Can't overload, because it wouldn't be identical. Would you call the one with two, or do you call the one with three? Just add the parameter to the bottom one, even though yes. it's not totally easy. We can't go to two, but we can go to both of them have three. One can be ignored. So we do that. We add the parameter. Now we can do the same trick we did before, where we cast the bar chart from the chart. Sweet. I'm just going to go ahead and do that down here, huh? Yep, we can do that. but. Well, but we're red. Well, we'll fix them both right now. Right. What do you, why not? So now they're no longer static. No longer static. It's running. We're back to green. Let's go back and now take off the cast to bar chart and add it to eye chart. Is this not fun, guys? Yeah, it's fun. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is that you still don't really know what rendering a pie chart or rendering a pie chart does. No, no idea. And, and so they're, they may very well be two completely different things, but we're using it with a, an interface with the same name and the same call. Well, and so they might be totally different things, but they can't be that different things. Because yeah. it does this step for a pie chart and it does this step for a bar chart. And it only does this one step. So they have to sort of fulfill the same polymorphism, even if they are doing it in completely different ways. Does that right, make sense? But, but basically, they're, they're different functions, but they're uh, in the same interface with the same thing, the same fault, yeah. sign, and so forth. Yeah, if they, so if they don't have the flat same... If block yeah. Again. So let's do that. And this becomes very interesting. Because now, let's, so let it run, see that it passes, check it in. So at this point, we have now broken apart our code enough that if we were to add a line chart, the, almost the only thing we'd be doing is adding a new file. One line Give it a good change, name, always. Right? In the, the thing that we did, where we added this concept of a line chart. That's a huge thing. The chances you're going to break your code by only adding a new file are almost non-existent. Let's go up to the top. We have a couple more little things to do. Look at the duplication here. Display type full, display type fit. We're going to use the same technique. We're going to add a new class of type display type. Why do I make that an enum? Uh, because you can't use an enum. They're strings. When you're designing new code, enums are great. But when you're refactoring old code, enums are horrible. So I'm just going to move those guys to this new guy. As publics. As publics. Why? Because other places are calling this with a string. If I change this to an enum, I have to find every place that calls it and make it pass me the enum. And there's that's bad. And there's not inherently a lot of benefit to it. So and, and I don't even know if it's getting called from data that's stored in a database, which would have to be transformed into an enum. There's a whole bunch of things here that make enums not practical on a refactor. As a general rule, when you're refactoring, enums are not something you can use. Oh, wait, hold on, but go back up there. So now we have some duplication. Display, type, full, split. Let's rename that to just full and split. We're really starting to get some very expressive code here, yeah. guys. Yeah, uh, because this is a form of documentation that we did not have before. Right? Now I have a single place that tells me what are my available display types and what are their values.
That's extremely useful. Uh, let's scroll down a little bit. This is really good. I, I want to sort of end here, but I want to do one more thing before we do. I want to go to, I don't even know which one it is. I think it's pie chart. Scroll down. I, want, I was looking for that black we saw earlier. There it is. Okay. So black means this code is never run. We have full total coverage, but this is still dead code. You can see why. Tell me why. <laughs> well, it's not that it's never going to be an empty string, but it's never going to simultaneously be an empty string and not an empty string. That rarely happens. <laughs> so this is dead code. Code that we would have taken out earlier if we had taken the time to look at this actual code and understand what it did, which we did not do. And that is why, if this code was the original 4,000 lines that it was, this technique would still work in about the same amount of time. These methods would be much bigger still, but they would still section out just as nicely. Because I don't need to read the 400,000 lines to understand what they do. So we're, all, we're almost out of time. I want to look at one little thing here. Is this original class, well, we can move this guy out yeah, too. Yeah, that right? guy out. So that's F6. a quick fix. Oh, yeah, that too. Okay. So, well, let's just close that guy and go back to here. Okay. And save everything. Uh, save everything. Control Shift S. Okay. So, what we have now is 88 lines where we had, in a single class, 287 or whatever. So, we've cut about two thirds. Now, we moved it to other places, right? But it's very, very easy now to understand that if we needed to add a line chart, what we need to do. And in fact, the interface would enforce that you did the three things. Right? That's true. It, the interface now is telling you what you need to code. So what do we need to do? Exactly. That's right. And what's our chances of breaking bar chart and line uh, pie chart? Zero. Now the only thing we need to do is probably come up with a better way to have a factory to decide which one we wanted to have. Yeah. But that's that's it. Uh, that's pretty dang simple, and I'm going to make a really big point about this. The guy that I did this for originally called me just a few weeks ago, long gone from that job. He's now actually an extremely good object-oriented programmer, and he's got a new job where he's got to do a bunch of charts. And he was just so jazzed that he knew exactly how to go about doing it because of this exercise that we had done. I thought that was pretty cool, just to hear back that, that idea. But I, I saw this application go from something that couldn't be maintained and just merely to add a line chart, we also got for free the ability to have a maintainable application. And to me, that was really a wonderful thing to see. It took us a lot more time than this, but there we go. What did you say? Well, I'm not too crazy about sending a parameter that is useless for one of the class. The data. A better way. No, no, he's talking about the display. There, yeah. there very well could be. Wait, wait, scroll. No, no, so that's important. If one of the classes need it, you need to pass it. It's important. It's the only way to get the polymorphism. However, at some point, we could have a, a, uh, a class that contains all the data that gets passed around. So there are, are ways to get away with it from it. But I think it's really important to consider something here. To get things to work nicely, there are some rules that we've learned to live by that maybe we are sticking with more than we need to. I've seen this an awful lot with the idea of exposing methods so that we they are more testable. Yeah. And people will say, no, no, can't expose those methods. These are rules we learned from the days when a lot of this stuff was a lot harder to do. And now we have very simple ways to do these things. So maybe that's a smell, maybe not. But overall, we have a much better solution than we had before. So if you have a good solution for, for that, find it, apply it, that's good. But in the meantime, let's move towards that polymorphic solution. And I think we can all agree, this is better than we were two hours ago. Yeah. And now we know what we're going to do as well. So the original question of how long will this take, we now are in a place where we can start to get a better understanding of that. So let's go back to our slides for a second and close this up. We're almost done, guys. That's all the right. first. That was the first half. Now we're on to the second half. Yeah. Just kidding. This is a statement from almost every place I've ever worked. But this is what we did, right? Bad card to cook. In small, little, two-minute steps. Oh, hold on, so I want to talk about it for a second. Hopefully you guys had fun doing this. 
One of the things I have come to enjoy a lot is refactoring. And one of the reasons is you're constantly being rewarded with better code. They're actually kind of fun days to go through. Two little minute increments of, hey, it's better, hey, it's better, hey, it's better. That feels really good. It used to be things I used to dread, now it's better. One of the things I noticed is as my code gets better, I have a general better happiness and quality of life. I find that I'm not alone. A lot of developers take a lot of personal identity and pride in their job. And when they have better code, they feel better, they're happier. They're more happy to go to work, they're less stressed when they come home. And they get to go home. Which is nice, because I know a lot of developers who would still be at work right now. And so, that's a really great feeling. <coughs> and the next steps. I don't know if we really want to... Uh... Well, so, we want you to try it. It's all great to come here and watch us, but until you go home and try it, so the next time you come into a block of code that's confusing, grab a buddy, because it's always better with a couple set of eyes. You can get a whole audience of eyes. It's great. And sit down and spend 25 minutes. Also, you might need to do some reading. Clean Code by Bob Martin. It's a great book. If you don't have that book, just get it. And this is a great book. I recommend very highly this Working Effectively with Legacy Code by Michael Feathers. It's where I, um, he codified or put together all the things I was trying to figure out on my own, and he saved me years of work as well. So all the things I had already kind of found, he had better ways of doing them, and he had a lot more other things to do that I could do to make my code cleaner quickly. These are books I recommend very highly. So let's go. Want a couple see more things? Okay. Oh, uh, so all the testing we did here is in approval tests. It's about 20 lines of code to test all Have that Have we code. done a talk on approval tests here? Maybe not. No. We could come do that sometime. We did? No, we haven't. Well, well uh, we've done them at code camps. We'll come back and do it. <laughs> we'll, yeah. We're happy to we'll, do more. Yep. Yeah. Uh, ah, and that's some of us. Yeah, we're always available, happy to help, happy to chat. Finally, yep. that was our goal. Some simple techniques for code excellence. Did we? Yeah. We'll do that? You ruined our big finish. <laughs> Don't worry, just email me and I'll send you my email address. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so simple techniques is what we were after for code excellence. Did we do that? That was our goal. Thank you, guys. We appreciate it.